Spirit of the Most High God, uh, happy to be in your homes another evening to share in Bible study, and we have been going through for the last couple of weeks examining and trying to identify exactly where we are in these times. We are at a very critical juncture in time, and personally, I am very happy to be a part of the church of the living God, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, to be a part of the kingdom for such a time as this. I believe we are in one of the most interesting periods of history and based on what has happened already in history and where we are now we are at a most interesting period and I'm very happy amen as I said earlier to be a part of the kingdom and many of us ought to be for such a time as this we have gone through quite a bit and we have received feedback from individuals and they have been asking they have been asking a number of pertinent questions based on what we have been discussing uh, certainly what we have um, delved in already what we have focused on so far uh, we have pulled from the Bible and we have been providing us scriptures and a few of the questions that have come in centers around if we could somehow put all that we have been saying in some perspective in terms of a sequence of events we are currently in the church age and we know what is happening we did say that the next uh, agenda or the next big event on God's agenda is the rapture of the church and folks have been saying we understand that but let's is there any way to put it into some kind of perspective so that we can see the church and then the rapture and then what happens after that and then what happens after that right down to the end so take it from where we are right down to the end and see if you know brother daily you could put it across to us so that we can see each of the elements uh, in their respective order right from this point down to the very end so we have done that and in a short while i will have a diagram a chart up that literally shows us where we are in time in terms of in the church and over the last couple of weeks we did indicate that at the end of this church age in fact the church will come to its conclusion here on earth at the time of the rapture and so we are going to be showing you the rapture then what happened after the rapture which we spoke about already the tribulation period and then what happens after the tribulation period which represents the revelation of jesus christ where he's going to come back with his saints and come to stand upon this very earth and then right after that we will be going into the millennium and then after the millennium the white throne judgment and then after the white throne judgment the new earth and we have put it together in a little chart that allows us to see the sequencing of the events so that we can have a better picture and then we give some of the explanations given what i have presented in the chart also uh, a couple of saints uh, some might not be saints from our assembly based on how some of the questions are posed uh, they they inquired about the rapture and after, what will we be doing during that period when we are there are we just going to be in heaven sitting in the clouds and you know what exactly is going to happen and so we did indicate 
it might have been last week or the week before, that when we are raptured as a church, we did say two things are going to take place while we are in heaven. One, there will be the judgment seat of Christ, the beamer, and two, there will be the marriage of the Lamb. And having said that, uh, we are going to use this evening and go into some details just to show that indeed we are going to be occupied, gainfully occupied, while we are in heaven. And simultaneous to us being there, we will just quickly go through again so that we can understand what will be happening on earth during that time. And then we will take our time and go through the millennium. Tell me about it. Because I never knew before now that there was such a thing that there was going to be a literal kingdom of God on earth. And quite a number of folks had indicated that. We know that when the rapture comes, we would have been taken off um, <clears throat> to heaven and we would have been with the Lord forever and forever. And that would have been the end of all things until judgment and God wipe everything out, out. And that's the end of the story. But the Bible did tell us that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. What will be the purpose of the new earth if there were not going to be inhabitants there? So we are going to put some things into perspective and indeed show that the Bible speaks about a literal kingdom of God here on earth and we will show you where it fits in and how it fits in and how you and i saints of the most high god once we make it in the rapture we're going to see where you and i are coming back with him to rule the nations with a rod of iron and it is in the bible it is in the word and i therefore ask us to spend a little time and focus on that as we go through. So this evening, what I will be doing is I will have the chart up and I will, while you are looking at it, in a little while, while you are looking at it, I will be going through and you will look at the chart so you will be seeing a little bit of the chart for a while, while I am talking and I ask that you have your pens and your papers because I will be relating some scriptures to us. I don't want to take the chart off to put the scriptures up and at the end of the scripture we put back the chart and as we read more scriptures we take the chart down. So I'm going to be leaving the chart on the screen and then I will be reading the scriptures to you. Take the notes in terms of the scriptures. So when I'm dealing with, for example, the church, I want you to put your heading the church and you're going to put the scriptures i will be not only giving you the scriptural references but i'll be reading a couple of them and then we'll be moved to the rapture and then we will move to what is going to be happening in heaven after the rapture i'll be giving you some scriptures uh this, the 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 chart will be there i ask you to listen attentively and i will be taking my time write the scriptures Listen to what is being said so that we can grasp it and then see the sequencing of what I am saying based on what I am presenting to you on the chart. Now, many of us don't quite grasp who we are as children of the most high God. We don't understand our position as children of God within the church. We don't realize how peculiar we are, how special we are. The Bible describes some uh, things to us and tells us that you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. And it goes on to explain that we have been called out of darkness into this marvelous light. Now many of us cannot or might not appreciate that even the prophets of old 
did not have a sense of who this body of called out believers were. They did not have a sense of exactly who and what the church was going to be doing and who exactly these people are. As far as the prophets were concerned, God called out through Abraham this special people. And through the seed of Abraham coming all the way down, the law was given to them and they were going to be the ones that would have guided and directed the nations of the world towards ultimately uh, finding Almighty God. But as far as the Jewish people that included all the prophets of old were concerned, God only with the Jews. Even if you were mixed like the Samaritans, the Samaritans and the Jews have no dealings. So just imagine them seeing, which they didn't see, but imagine them, they understanding that they were going to be, or there would have been a body that called Gentiles, dogs, those that were not a people, those that were not considered. How under God's heaven could this have happened that Gentiles were called into a body and were chosen by God to be special, to be peculiar, and not only that, for God not to have revealed it to them. And so I want us to understand that this grouping, this body of called out believers that you and I are part of, very special group amongst the prophets of old I person personally believe that Daniel was endowed with revelations from God deeper than any of the others simply because he was given some of the most detailed the most minute of details were revealed to him down to the very time when Messiah was going to be cut off. Daniel worked it down to the day. And he knew that level of details. And yet, Daniel did not see exactly that there was going to be a body of believers in what is called the church, the church of Jesus Christ. In fact, I invite us to turn to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter, chapter 9 and verse 26. And I'll just read it for us. It says, and after three score and two weeks, and this is a scripture that we have read before, so we all should be familiar with it. And after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself. So he's speaking here about the death of the Messiah. And after he's cut off, he went on to say, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So here Daniel is speaking about things that were going to be happening in the end times. And he prophesied that Messiah the prince was going to be cut off. And Daniel in his... 70 weeks prophecy uh, gave time frames when this would have happened. So he knew that Messiah was going to be cut off at a particular point. And then after Messiah was cut off, he went right on to speak about the people of the prince that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, talking about the Antichrist, and he's going to come and he's going to sit in the sanctuary and the sanctuary is going to be destroyed and the end thereof shall be with a flood so daniel spoke of the death of messiah he continued immediately to talk about the prince that shall come which is the man of sin the antichrist he spoke about things right down to the end where he said and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined and so Daniel went right to the end. From the time that the Messiah was cut off, right to the end, Daniel went there and said nothing more. Yet you and I, brethren, know 
that when Messiah was cut off, indeed it was not for himself, but when Messiah was cut off, you know what emerged out of that? The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, 18, and I say unto you, Peter, or I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Jesus, at this point, started to tell the disciples what was going to happen in a while, what was going to happen after his death, what was going to happen in terms of a church being formed. And Daniel prophesied way beyond that point, and he did not see the church. And so when we talk about the church, brethren beloved, we are talking about a group of people, you and I, who are special. We are talking about a group of people, you and I, who are called out. And let us put into perspective exactly what it was that God was doing. St. John chapter 1, and again I'm reading for us, St. John chapter 1, and make a little note of this, because I want us to have these scriptures, St. John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. And let us read. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. One. Two. I want us to look at Acts chapter 15. That's Acts chapter 15 and verse 14. And it says, Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. It is important that we start to recognize that when it comes to the church, there was something peculiar, something special. The prophets of old didn't know about it, but God was now revealing some things in the New Testament, showing us exactly who we were and exactly what it is that he was doing. And so whereas he started with Abraham and everything was going through the Jewish line, right through in the plan of God, he had somewhere where he was going to bring in the Gentile nation, the dogs, the people that were not a nation, and he was going to do something peculiar, something special, and something different with us. Listen to what he said through the Apostle Paul to the Romans, Romans chapter 11 and verse 25. And here's what he said, Romans chapter 11 and verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, and he calls it a mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So here it was that God all along was working through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes coming all the way down. And yet, God caused blindness to come upon Israel formed this church and brought in people that were never considered could have been called and used by God. And God placed them in a body called the church and you and I are a part of it. To this day, 
many Jews reject the church because there can be no body, there can be no organization, there can be no organism that could be such that it embrace and pull and hold Gentiles and have them as a critical part of that organization. That is unheard of. It goes on further. And this is how Peter puts it in First Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. And here is what it says, just to reinforce the point about the prophets not even sure what was happening. And we need to understand how special we are. So when we present to us what is in store for the church, and some folks leave with the impression that as a church we make ourselves out to be too much. No, 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 no. We are special. We have been made that way by Almighty God. Yes, the prophets were great, but even the prophets looked into and inquired after what you and I are in. The Bible said even angels desire to look into this. Don't take what you have lightly as a child of God. You are special, you are peculiar, and treat gingerly and guard with your entire heart that which you have because we are into a very personal body, personal to Almighty God, and it means everything to Him. And let me tell us how far it is. You and I are into a body that is now Befraud, exposed, engaged to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are special. So hear what the Apostle Peter have to say about this body that you and I are in. First Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently they prophesied from this mountain top and they prophesied over to another mountain top and they saw the antichrist coming and they saw the great tribulation period they called it the time of jacob's trouble they saw down to jesus himself messiah the prince being buffeted and being killed and they saw all of that right down to the point when they prophesied again about the millennial reign when Jesus sit up on the throne of his father David. They prophesied right down to that period and beyond. And nowhere did they see the church. God hid it. And not even the angels knew what he was coming with, but he came with something absolutely great. And so of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what? Or of what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Which things the angels desire to look into? You and I are special. So when we tell you that the church is going to be taken out of this world and God is almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ himself is going to come in the air and take us out, it sounds as if we are extra special given what we hear is going to be happening on earth. But I, I have gone through these scriptures to let us understand that we are special and also to put into perspective where we are in time right now being in the church. We are in the period 
or we are in a period that the prophets themselves knew nothing of. And so I'm going to very shortly put the chart up, give you a moment to look at it, and then I'm going to start to go through event by event and indicate where we are, give us some scriptures, and then let us go through with everything in perspective, step by step, so that we come to a better understanding. So we look at, at this time, the chart, and we are going to show us right where we are in the church. If we look to the left of the chart, if we look to the left of the chart, we are going to see a circle there. And it starts with the church. That is where we are now. A member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is where we are now. Now, in our discussions, in our discussions, the chart, in our discussions, um, we did indicate to us that the next item on the agenda is going to be the rapture of the church. We did indicate, and it is important that we understand that that is so, that is Bible. So as you look at the chart, you see exactly where we are. And then while you look, I'm giving you a little time, I will be talking, but Listen closely to what I'm saying, even as you look at the chart. There is the church, and as you look beside it, you see the tribulation, and as you look, going on the line, you see the millennium, then your next big ticket item is the new earth. But then in between some of these big ticket items are some things. If you can't see it very clearly, uh, I will you know, just indicate to you what is there so that you can understand exactly where we are and what we are saying. Now, the next item on the agenda for the church, you see some arrows going up. We are talking about the translation of saints, the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, amen, verses, we'll just go from verses 16 to 18, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is speaking about the rapture. That is speaking about the Lord coming down in the clouds of heaven and he's going to be in the air and he's going to make that call and we are going to hear that call and we will be changed. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 to 53 puts it like this. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed and so so we can see that at the rapture the saints are going to leave and we are going to meet the Lord in the air. Yes, we cannot go, and we said it the last time, we cannot go with the bodies that we have, because these bodies that we have, and for those saints that are dead, they are rotten. They have rotted, and these bodies are corruptible. Yes, susceptible to maggot and worm and all the kind of things that is, is called corruption. But when the trumpet sounds, when God Almighty, the Lord Jesus, gives that shout, 
there is going to be in the in a split second there is going to be a massive change we shall be changed and our bodies are going to be fashioned we are going to have bodies fashioned like unto his glorious body the body that he resurrected with it is the bodies that we are going to have and is going to be a, what we go up with to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be changed. Those that are in the grave, it is their, their bodies, all the atoms, everything is going to come together. It will be changed and the corruptible bodies will put on incorruption and yes, we shall be changed and we will meet him in the air. So at the rapture, the Lord is coming for us. We meet him in the air and he take us back to heaven where a number of things are going. Seven years. And so at the rapture when we go up, in that seven year period when it will be tribulation on earth, some things will be happening with the people of God. And a couple of folks have written and people have asked, saints have asked, unsaved have asked, what will be happening in heaven at that time that the Lord will, would have, you know, he took us out of the wrath that was to come and took us to heaven. What will be happening there? And we say two major events. One, the judgment seat of Christ. And two, the marriage of the Lamb. And the Bible speaks to them both. So we turn to the chart right now. And I want us to look. And I want us to see the church going up. And we are now in heaven. Right. We are now in heaven. So we will start. And we, we, we don't have an order in which the events will take place. But I believe that you would want to deal with the business matters first before we then go on to the actual marriage of the Lamb. And so one of the major, major events that's going to be taking place while we have, are in heaven, having been raptured, and just keep focused on that chart because we are going to give us some scripture and I want us to understand. So the judgment seat of Christ and it is important that we understand, it is important that we recognize that as children of God, as people of the most high God, we all are accountable to him. We are accountable to God for the things that we do in our lives, having surrendered to him and having uh, given him everything, given him our heart, given him our lives. He saved us. He placed us in the church and he expects us, yes, to live a holy life, but he also expects us to live a productive life as a son of God. Productive in terms of the service the things that we do for him. It brings to our consciousness, and I'm talking about the judgment seat, one of the two things that we are going to be doing in heaven. It brings to our consciousness that a day is coming when as children of God we shall stand face to face with Jesus, one and one, in a setting where we will be called upon to give an account of how we lived our lives as Christians while we were on earth. We will have to answer to the great king as to our motives and our intentions in doing what we did in our time as Christians. Now I want to make a point very clear because um, it, I believe it is important that we understand that the judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment unto condemnation. 
That is later on where there's going to be the white throne judgment. The judgment seat of Christ. Notice that those who go up in the rapture are those who are going to be standing at the judgment seat of Christ. Notice that it is those that have been redeemed that is going to be standing at the judgment seat of Christ. So that it is not a judgment to condemnation. Right? No one at the judgment seat will be condemned to hell. It is a judgment for believers concerning how we treated with our stewardship while we were here on earth. And that is very important that we understand that concept and that principle. Because a lot of folks, having gotten saved, they believe that that is the end of the story. And I can do anything. I don't have to participate. I don't have to be involved. I don't have to serve God. I don't have to do good works. Uh, and we are going to have a rude awakening if that is how we present ourselves. Because we will stand before God on that particular day. Now, there are two scriptures that I quickly will read for us as we appreciate what is going to be happening in heaven while we are there. One scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. All of us as saints, and Paul was writing to the Corinthian church and telling them that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Remember this, brothers and sisters, when the rapture takes place and we get to heaven, first order of business, we are going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul spoke to the Romans also, and in Romans chapter 14, verses 10 to 12, he puts it this way, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, said the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And so, brothers and sisters, do not be fooled. A day is coming when we will be rewarded and we will be vindicated as believers. The stance that we have taken for Jesus, the things that we have done for him, all that we have done in righteousness, it will pay off. And ultimately, men will see and know that we were right after all. But at the same time, you and I must recognize, must realize that we are going to give an account to God for how we lived our lives. The question is, why? Why such a thing for the saints? Isn't it that where on earth no one anything wrong we do, uh, we can go to God and ask him for forgiveness? Two things we must not mix up. Yes, while we are on earth, we will make mistakes all the way down. We will sin and we will be restored. We will sin and we will be restored. Those things we must treat with here on earth. The judgment seat is not to judge us for the sins that we have done. The judgment seat is to judge us for our service, our stewardship, the way that we lived our lives of service to him. And so there are two things that represent the primary purpose of the judgment seat of Christ. One, it is a time of examination and the Lord will examine the lives and the service of the believers and two it will be a time of rewarding rewarding for the saints and God will reward them 
and reward those who are worthy of recognition. Remember again, saints, we are all accountable to God. And so, what is it that God will look at? What is it that God will examine? Don't forget, no saints, all of this are taking place in heaven after the rapture. Yes? And it is important. It is important that that is the understanding that we have. Again, I turn us to the chart. Again, I want us to be looking at the top where we see judgment seat of Christ. Very important. And we are going through that. So we will be, it will be a time of examination and it will be a time of rewarding. What do you mean by rewarding? Did you know that the Bible in St. Matthew chapter 6 verses 20 and 21 tells us that look, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust does corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal for where your treasure is there will your heart be also. Understand saints of God. Understand people of God that it is what we do here on earth, the service, the diligence, the faithfulness, how we conduct ourselves, the stewardship that is going to be the currency that allow us to lay up treasures in heaven. It's not if you have 10 million, you put 1 million aside in, the, in a fixed deposit and think that that is going to be transferred to heaven. No, that will never go. It is what we do, how we do it, why we do it, the motives behind our, our living. And never, ever forget that. And while he looks at the motive, the quantity of what we do, the quality of what we do is going to come to the fore. He said in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, he who sows, and I drop in the gospel seed generously, will reap abundantly. And I dare say the opposite is also true. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Uh, all right? Very important. Note this though, that faithfulness is one of God's standards for success and that's the reason why he said in first corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2 moreover it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful very 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 important very 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 important so i Look at you again, saints of God, and I remind us, I challenge us, I urge us, I implore us. It is not the passing on of information that really moves me, that drives me to tell us about the Antichrist and to tell us the sequence of things that is going to happen and to let us know the order in which it will come and all of those things. And so we are fully equipped with information. What is information? If at the end of the day, our lives are not transformed. What is information? If we can recite the order of things to come and know how it will follow and know how it will flow and our lives are not moved and not set in order. What sense does it make? And the trumpet sounds, and we just know that I knew that this was going to happen, and I know what is going to happen next, and our lives and our hearts are not moved into action. And so every time that I present information, every time that I uh, share some things about the sequencing and the order, it is for one reason, so that we can appreciate and understand the seriousness of the things that are coming and that we govern ourselves accordingly. It is very, very, very important. And so 
yes, we are going to stand before him even at the rapture. The rapture itself is going to be a joyous occasion. Imagine hearing the sound. Imagine the feel when we leave Earth's gravitational pull. Imagine what it is going to be like to be flying out of here in a supersonic, hypersonic, well, at hypersonic speed. In the twinkling of an eye, what a feeling. What a zest. What a great euphoria. But when we get there, we are going to have to face our Savior. And we are going to have to contend with him. He who searched the heart and the rain. So we're not there to judge the sins. Because that was judged already at Calvary. And when we make mistakes in terms of our walk, in terms of living in sin, we better deal with it here. Otherwise, we are not going to be in the rapture any at all, anyway. So for those who think that, oh, I can make it, and I don't have to get any reward once I make it, huh? If we are living in sin here, don't worry. You don't have to worry about making it by the skin of your teeth. We're not going to make it if we're not living right. I, I love to talk the truth, you know, and I, you know, sometimes I smile. But I'm serious as a judge. We're not going to make it if we're not living the life. Holiness unto the Lord is our watchword and song. And so, standing at the judgment seat of Christ is not for sin. It's not to condemnation. Nobody there is going to go to hell. But some people are going to be embarrassed. Yes, some people there are going to be crying. In heaven, the Bible says God shall wipe, and it is only because of the great mercies of God. So we know it is going to change you know, after a while because God is going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. And if those tears of joy, we don't normally wipe away tears of joy. But I believe at, at some point there will be tears of remorse. There will be tears of regret when we consider what we could have done. Can you imagine when we stand before the king? He just raptured us and we're standing before him and we, we're seeing him in all of his glory and his might and his majesty. And we realize that we sat down here on earth and did nothing and come empty handed before him. I don't want that to happen to me. I wouldn't want that to happen to you. But brothers and sisters, we are going to stand before him. You know, Paul closed with a particular scripture and he used the analogy or typology of a master builder a construction worker and he said take heed how you build take heed of the material that you use take heed of the reason why we do what we do be careful of your motives because motives and reasons will determine whether the material that we are using to in our service for God, our material of wool, wood, hay, or stubble, or precious stone, gold, all the precious materials that were mentioned. Be very careful. Everything that we do are going to be tried by fire. And the fire is the piercing eyes, the piercing presence of Almighty God, Jesus Christ himself, who searched the heart and the rain and who knows everything and nothing is hid from him with whom we have to do. So yes, in heaven, we are going to stand before the judgment seat and all of us will give an account. The next big thing that is going to be happening in heaven when we are raptured, we are moving into a great, in my view, one of the greatest experiences that we could ever have. That is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let us look back at the, the, the chart. Right at the top where we see judgment seat, there's a next chart that should have, or, or a next item that should have been there. 
and that would have been the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I hear when we look at this scripture, I want us to make note of this scripture. Write it down, brothers and sisters. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 to 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Very, very, very important. Um, brothers and sisters, at the start of Revelation, right up to about chapter 4, we read about the church. In fact, we read about the seven churches in the earlier books in Revelation. God speaking to them, God, you know, indicating some things that if they hold on, what he's going to do for them. And the church was there in the earlier part. And I observed that in Revelation chapter 4, um, <clears throat> there was a cry, come up hither. Whatever that means, afterwards, the apostle had a vision in heaven and he saw some elders. And the elders had crowns on their heads. And we all accept that they refer and they are an illustration of none other than the church of Jesus Christ. Because they had crowns and the Bible talked to us and tell us that there are crowns that we as children of God are going to get. And we are not going to get the crowns when we are here. We are going to get the crowns when we are in heaven. So that at the rapture when the church goes up and we go through the beamer and the rewards are given having end the judgment seat experience we will be given crowns and so the apostle john saw that the elders were there all in crowns and they took the crowns and they cast at his feet so it is widely believed and we accept that it makes reference to the church and he saw the church in heaven Notice that from Revelation 4 all the way down to Revelation 19, no reference is made of the church anywhere. The tribulation period is going through, no reference is made of the church. The, 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 the vials of God are being poured out, the seals are being opened, the trumpets are being sounded, all kind of horrific things are happening. And at no point throughout the entire rest of Revelation, after chapter 4, going down, is any reference made of the church. Have you ever wondered why? Because the church is not on earth. Here in Revelation 19, we are hearing, Be glad, rejoice, the marriage of the Lamb is here. And where are we as a church? In heaven. In heaven. And so I would like us to understand that yes, what we saw, and let's look at it again on the chart because we are going down now. What we, what we have seen is that the church is there. The church would have been raptured. We looked at those scriptures. The church went up and in heaven won the judgment seat. And two, we are now at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I want us to notice the language that Paul used at one particular point. Yes, I want us to notice the language in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have exposed you 
to one husband or I have caused you to be engaged to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And that word um, betrothed means simply or espoused, means to be engaged or to be betrothed. Engaged as you and I in the Western world know. And so, from time to time, our, or from the time that we were converted as Christians, from the time that you and I were filled with the Spirit and were baptized in His name, from that time all the way down to the point of the rapture, we are engaged to Christ. We are exposed to Christ. And this is what Paul was saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. We are befrotted to him. And we are going to, to explain what these terms mean in a little while. So we are still in heaven. We are and, and we are looking at the chart. We are still in heaven. Yeah. We are still in heaven. And we are going to take a little time out to understand what is taking place at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the marriage of the Lamb is better understood in light of the wedding custom in the time of Jesus Christ. There were three main parts to this wedding. First, and I'm talking when I I'm talking about the first phase or the first stage. The marriage contract is signed by the parents of the bride and the groom. The bridegroom himself or his parents would then pay what is called a dowry, a sum of money. And for some people, it is an expensive venture. Some folks can't even get married because they can't afford the dowry. Right? So the, the, the groom, yes, uh, or his parents had to pay a dowry to the bride or to the bride's parents. And that is something that we must first understand. This happens in the first phase of the wedding. And so when this is done, and an official contract, an agreement is there that yes, we are going to be together. This period begins what is called the be betrothal period or the espousal period or what you and I would know as the engagement period, amen, of the relationship. It's the very same thing that happened if you look in the book of St. Matthew, chapter number 1 and verse 18, you will see exactly what I'm talking about. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when as his mother Mary was exposed to Joseph before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Ghost that's what we are talking so they weren't together yet but they were exposed they had gone through the contract they had done what they had to do the door was already paid but they were now waiting for the actual marriage ceremony which is another phase right that would come so the first phase is the marriage contract the first phase continues with the paying of the dowry the first phase ends with the process of engagement what is called betrothal what is called exposed he's exposed to the lady that is going to be his bride now the second phase right <clears throat> comes sometime after usually about a year and i want us to follow me keenly i want us to see exactly what is happening because jesus lived this thing out and it shows you how important and how critical this rapture and going to heaven is it is something that was planned from the very foundation of the earth and what was happening in the life of israel over time in terms of how they conducted weddings it was fulfilled with the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. And so follow me carefully. The second phase, which is the second stage, 
is simply this now. So what happened? After a period of time, the bridegroom, having gone through that first stage, would have left and gone back to his regular abode. But after a period of time, usually about a year, the groom and his friends would come back. Right? And they would come back and they would go straight to the house of the bride. And guess what normally happens? That arrangement where they come back and go to the house of the bride, they usually do it in the night time at midnight. That was the custom. Why they did it? They wanted to have what this was, was called, and they created what was called a torchlight parade throughout the street. So they came at midnight, and then the bride would have known that the husband or the, the bridegroom was going to come in. So she then, knowing that the time was near, she started putting herself together. Every day she sought out something with her um, bridal garment. She makes sure that her lamp is trimmed and everything so that when the bridegroom came that particular night, she would have been ready. And that was the custom. In fact, in fact um, this was the basis for the parable of the ten virgins in the book of St. Matthew chapter 25 and i ask us to read it can i read it now verses 1 down to 13 make a note of it that was the basis for the parable of the ten virgins yes so when the bride knew that the bridegroom was coming she will get together and all the maidens that were with her will jump about get them the the, the, the wedding clothes together and they will trim their lamps and they go out to join the bridegroom in that procession and together have a torch light parade in the streets. Now, the third and final stage was the marriage itself. Because what would happen? This bridegroom that came to get her, and having completed that torch light ceremony, the bridegroom now takes the lady, takes the bride back to his home. When he left, the betrothal when he left and went back home he went and he built a new house and that house is where when he came for his bride later on finished what he was doing he was going to take her back and take her right into that new house they would complete the marriage ceremony they would then go to the new house and they would start their life together as husband and wife and so yes that was the represented the three stages and let me tell us that final stage after the marriage and then they have the house where they were going to be in that ceremony went on for days it's not like us here in the western world at after we have the ceremony we're going to take a three hours and then it is all over it goes on for days saint john chapter 2 verses 1 to 2 makes us understand exactly what happened. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples. And of course, we know at the, at the end of the three days, when all the things were over in terms of the wine, they went to Jesus. They went to Jesus. And Jesus simply did what he had to do in terms of the miracle. But certain amount of days had already passed. This is how the thing went. This is exactly what happened. And so, and so, we want to know, look exactly what was happening here. The first stage of our relationship with Jesus, we have already noticed that when John looked in Revelation 19 and verse 7. He was seeing the third phase of the marriage. The first stage had already gone. That first stage is when you and I accepted him. And he came and took us and said, I want you. And we accepted the invitation. And we were converted and we accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
and that represented our espousal. Paul said it. He has exposed us to one husband, and he's jealous. And that was our espousal. It's there in the word. We were engaged to him. And right now, in time, until the day of the rapture, we are still engaged. We are at the point of our betrothal, our espousal, our engagement. That is where we are now. Then after the, and in this period, Jesus, the bridegroom, paid the dowry. And he paid it. Did I say earlier on that sometimes it's an expensive venture? Did I say earlier on that sometimes it can't be afforded because it is costly? Well, he paid the price. And brothers and sisters, it wasn't a bull. It wasn't a ram. It was his own blood, precious, that he gave. The most expensive thing or commodity on the face of the earth, in heaven, under the earth, the blood of Jesus was the dowry price. And Jesus paid it. So we are engaged to him right now. And we are in the phase where after he did the engagement and we were betrothed to him. We are exposed to him. He left us. And if we recall the scripture in St. Matthew, in St. John, sorry, chapter number 14. If we recall the scripture in St. John chapter 14, I believe verse 2 and 3. In my father's house are many mansions, starting from earlier. If it were not so. I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He was relating exactly what the bridegroom in Jewish custom did. What the bridegroom in Jewish custom did. So guess what? He left. And we are still engaged. And we are here, brothers and sisters, right now waiting literally waiting for him to come at that midnight hour to take us just like the bridegroom of old would do to take the bride back to the place that he went to prepare jesus tells us that he has gone to prepare a place for us and he is going to come for us and the time that he comes is what we call the rapture so we are betrothed to him and the rapture is when he's going to come for us and we are going to meet him in the air and then we are going to be taken by him to our home. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. So he's going to take us there and we are going to be in mansions superb. We are going to be in a place that is the home of our soul. Souls. We are going to be in a place that is beautiful beyond measure, beautiful beyond comparison. If you talk about beauty, just wait. If you talk about architectural designs that are out of this world, you need to see. He has taken all this time. I know of architects that have taken two, three, four, five years to put the most beautiful of designs together. It's nearly 2,000 years now that Jesus is putting this together. And oh, what a beauty it is going to be. And so any day now, any time now, because we have already gone through and showed that we are in the season of his return. And any day now, Jesus could put in his appearance. And he's coming to take us up, having been exposed to him over this time, to take us to heaven. And we are going to have the marriage of the Lamb, which is extremely, extremely beautiful. It is what we have been waiting for. It is what our hearts have been panting after. And the day is going to come, and we will seal that marriage at that time. Like I said, in the 
days when Christ was here, the marriage ceremony would have gone on for days. When we get there, it is going to be rolling for just about seven years. Of course, in between, as I said before, we would have started with the judgment seat of Christ, would have wrapped that up, and then would have been at the marriage. And won't it be a time? It is going to be a massive time. It is going to be a beautiful occasion. And the consummation would take place. I want to be there. I have to be there. I don't want to be engaged to him and go break the engagement because of sin. I don't want to be engaged to him right now and, 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 and break the espousal because I want to have my own way while I'm living here. You leave me and let me live for God. Let me live a holy life. Let me live a righteous life. Let me do my best. Let me lose myself and find it, Lord, in thee. Whatever happens, whatever it takes, I must make it in the rapture. Brothers and sisters, whatever happens, whatever it takes, you must be in the rapture. I want us to be there. I wish we'd all be ready, as the song said. I wish we'd all be ready. I wish we'd all be ready for that great day. And so we are going to be there in heaven. And we are going to be going through the marriage supper of the Lamb. Unless you think that it is going to be just disembodied spirits, we would have had a new body. We would have had a body that is incorrupt, incorruptible. We would have had a body that would have gone through transformation. Yeah, we are going to be able to feel the body. Can we recall that when Jesus was resurrected, the disciples and others, up to about 500 folks, saw him? You remember he was able to talk to the disciples and say, touch me. You remember Peter saw him and they went and they boiled fish and get on a comb and they give him and him eat with them in his resurrected state. Brothers and sisters, the marriage supper is just that. We are going to have a supper. We are going to eat. We are going to drink. We are going to see each other. We are going to have the time of our lives. And none of us ought to miss this great event. And so to the many individuals that wrote and wanted to find out what is going to happen in heaven when we are raptured, the culmination, yes, the binding together, yes, the tying of our lives as husband and wife will take place at that time. And so in heaven, at the rapture when we get there, the judgment seat and the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we are going to have the time of our lives for the next seven years. Yes, that time is going to be through. And at the end of that period, as I close, we are going to be coming back. The Bible said in Revelation, yes, after that period, you know, after that seven-year period, after the time of having the marriage supper of the Lamb, after going through that great experience and basking in the presence of the Lord and enjoying what the Lord, I don't know where he's going to carry us um, for honeymoon, I believe, all of those planets that are uninhabited, I believe all of those places that we hear and read about, he is going to take us on an excursion. Down here we take carnival cruise and ship and all kind of thing and take plane and go, oh, no, 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 we are going to be bigger than that. I believe with all of my heart that the Lord is going to give us a tour of the universe. And won't it be a time and then when we get back and we are settled and we have it all in place, Revelation chapter 19 tells us and makes it abundantly clear as we move to wrap up. And I saw heaven opened. And after everything is done up there, it is going to be time for us to come back to this earth. And he said, John saw it, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And verse 14 tells us, and the armies 
which were in heaven. That's you and I. That's the saints who left with him. That's the saints who he came for at the end of the marriage supper. And when all that is over, he's going to be coming back to this earth. And when he comes back, that's the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you look at the chart, and let's look one more time at the chart. If we look at the chart, we are going to see at the right side of the tribulation. Right? We are going to see at the right side. And why, although we are looking at it, there should be an arrow coming down. Yes, there should be an arrow coming down that shows and indicates the saints coming back with Jesus Christ at that time. Because in that day, he is going to stand upon the Mount of Olives. In that day when he comes, he is going to confront the armies of Armageddon. In that day, he is going to destroy and discomfort those who try to annihilate and mash up this earth. And he is going to destroy them with the brightness of his coming. And he is coming to set up a kingdom which was promised before. And so the saints are going to be coming with him. Verse 14 of the same, Revelation 19 tells us, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Very important that we understand that. Jude also told us uh, in verse 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Is coming at that time. On the chart, we see the church. Then we saw the church raptured. Then we saw the church in heaven. Uh, in heaven, the judgment seat of Christ. Also in heaven, the marriage supper of the Lamb. When that is true, we are coming back with Jesus for his revelation to this earth. It is here that those that are on the earth and every eye shall see him and those also which pierced him shall see him and will because of him. And he's coming back at that time. And we are coming with him. And here he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. I say this to say, if you, the chart is coming down and we are showing. Because the next thing that we are going to see is the millennial kingdom. The next thing that we are going to see, and that is exactly what the chart has outlined, the church, the rapture, heaven, what is taking place in heaven, why those things are taking place in heaven, some things are happening on earth, which is the tribulation period, and then at the end of the tribulation, then at the end of the marriage supper, Jesus is coming back to earth. The saints are coming with him. Take on the armies of Armageddon. And right after that, he will be ushered in to a period of time called the millennial, at the millennium. And brothers and sisters, as I close, there will be peace on earth. There will be a time that we could only imagine unheralded peace. The lamb and the lion together eating straw. We are going to talk about that when we get back next week. And we are going to see the sequence that there is a literal kingdom of God that is coming on this earth. And Jesus is going to sit on the throne of his father David and he's going to rule the nation. And when the Bible says that Israel will be the head and not the tail, it is going to be at that time and we are going to show it to us from the word of God. And this is Bible. Yes, you have said that you didn't know it like this, but we are just expounding the word. We are opening it up. We are taking time. We are giving us the scripture slowly. And this is the sequence of events. So where we are now, we got, get back next week, God's willing, we are going into the millennium. And we are going to look at all that is going to happen there. Who is going to be in the millennium? What is going to happen? Who will Jesus rule over? Who will we rule over? Is it really real? What we do today will determine the position that we hold. 
in that kingdom that is to come, let us live for God. Let us live with all of our heart. Let us make our calling and election sure because the next big event is the rapture of the church. God bless you. God bless you. In Jesus' name, let us pray. We give you thanks again, great God, our Father, for this opportunity to gather together in our respective homes to hear the words of the living God. I thank you for the many that have called, that have written, that have indicated that they want to hear more and to learn more about the things that are to come. This will help them to sharpen their lives. This will help them and help all of us, mighty God, to do what we must to make our calling and election sure. Mighty God, help us to make it in the rapture. Oh, that none of your people will be left behind. I lift my hands and I cover the people of God. I cover every member of our local assembly. I cover every member of our organization. I pray over the body of Christ in general. God Almighty, help us to understand where we are in time and that we will do what we must to make it in the rapture. Because if we miss it, we would have missed it all. We bless your great name, mighty God. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Continue to bless our land. Continue to help our people. Continue to direct our leaders. And let the name of Jesus be glorified. All oh, the glory of Jesus, in spite of what is happening, it is shining brighter and brighter. Have your own way. Let your will be done. We give you thanks and we glorify you, mighty God. You are great. And you are greatly to be praised. Let your will be done. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And next week this time, God's willing. Next week this time, if the Lord tarries. If not, on the air and in the air. God bless you. Love you, brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name.